from our studios in the Southern Food and Beverage Museum in New Orleans. Welcome to our Louisiana Eats podcast series, Quick Bites. I'm Poppy Tooker. Call him whatever you like. Brash, bold, authoritative, unapologetic, or arrogant. Donald Link is above all else one hell of a chef. Over the years, he and his restaurant partners have won five James Beard Awards. Donald himself has now been nominated eight times. Back in the spring of 2014, we sat down with Donald as he shared a very personal glimpse into the forces that came together to turn that West Louisiana boy into the successful, award-winning chef and restaurateur he is today. At the time we recorded the interview, Donald's colorful language and frank attitude required a very careful edit in order to broadcast the material. This podcast is Donald Link Uncensored, with every profane word restored to the original track. If cursing offends you, this podcast may not be for you. To begin our conversation... I asked Donald how old he was when he first began cooking. Um, God, it just seems like it was always there. I mean, as a kid growing up, I mean, everybody cooked. You know, it's it was just a it's a home cook thing. You know, it wasn't. It just seems like something you were supposed to do, and and you, you everyone was supposed to know how to cook because everybody you know how Louisiana is. Everybody's got their stuff that they do, and everyone thinks that their stuff's the best, and their mom makes the best gumbo. Yeah. So I just kind of grew up that way, and growing up at my age, it was you had to go to college or you'd be worth nothing. And Where'd you go to college? LSU. LSU? Gosh, what'd you study at LSU? Uh, finance. So you got that finance degree from LSU, just like a responsible well, dude. And didn't technically get a degree. Oh. I like to say I finished college. Because <laughs> you decided when you were done? <laughs> I had one semester left and walked out of a... QBA 3000 level class and just I'm sitting in there with 200 people I was like I fucking hate this I don't want to I'm sorry can I cuss on this show I said I hate this I don't want to do this for a living I was sitting behind a desk and crunching numbers and working for somebody I, was like, I just walked out I threw the books in the trash on the way out didn't didn't drop the classes or anything just so that's it for me <laughs> go find something else to do and that's how it all started you know as usual like through high school I cooked uh-huh uh, I cooked in McDonald's and Cotton's Hamburgers and some Mexican restaurant. So I just went back to cooking. You know, I went back to Sammy's Bar and Grill because it was fun and the girls were pretty. <laughs> yeah. And we got to go play golf on the Sundays and drink at the Gator Bar on Sunday night. I mean, it was a great life, you know, just go fry up some veggie baskets and po' boys and make some omelets <laughs> on Sunday and then, you know, go hang out with the, with the guys. I mean, it was just just fell in love with the lifestyle, too. I mean, uh-huh. food was always there, and this the lifestyle that really sold me on being a, a cook. And when I moved to San Francisco, I decided to make it official. Okay. So it was culinary school that you decided, okay, well, that's where I'm going to go. I'll go study in California because, after all, there was well, like a rock and food scene yeah, not happening. A, yeah, not exactly like that. I met a girl at LSU. Um, we moved to San Francisco together, and at the time, I was debating whether or not to, you know, go back to school. Because at that time, you know, growing up at that my age, it was you had to go to college or you'd be worth nothing, and there was always this pressure to do it. So, but you know, the first thing I did when I got to San Francisco, I got a job cooking at Spaghetti Western. It's like a breakfast joint <laughs> uh, where all the rock stars and heroin addicts used to go. They'd come in all right, and then they go to the bathroom and come out and fall asleep at the breakfast counter. That must have been a glamorous job. It was job. great, yeah. Um, <laughs> but they asked me to start cooking at dinner. So they wanted to do, they found out I was from Louisiana. I'm like, we should do a Cajun thing at dinner. And so I did that for six months, and it was great, man. I got busy. It was an open kitchen. I met so many cool, interesting people. I really liked the people I cooked with. And then they sold that restaurant, and the owners brought me to their place um, on the other side of Hate, Upper Hate, called Cha Cha Cha. That was a Caribbean restaurant. It was super busy, three-hour wait, cash only. I mean, it was a really rocking place, and that was where I learned to cook fast. Like two cooks doing, what, four or 500 people a night? Wow. And I made a bunch of money. I worked six days a week. I mean, we got cash tips. We got overtime. I mean, it was killing it. 
And then it hit me at that point. I was like, okay, so is this it? Is this the end of the road? Is this where it goes? I mean, at that time, I was like, I can't imagine making any more money doing this. Um, but God, I can't imagine working this hard for the rest of my life. I mean, 12-hour days, six, seven days a week. The toll it takes on the human body. Yeah, even at 23, it was like, man. I'm tired. <laughs> my ass kicked. <laughs> But I wanted to take it farther, you know. I wanted to see what else was out there. And being around in San Francisco, you know, you start seeing all the, you know, the big name restaurants. And uh, so I decided to go to culinary school. And that's when I started getting into the finer dining establishments. About what year was this? I was in 93. Uh-huh. And went and worked for a crazy French guy at Flying Saucer because they said no one could work for him. When I started school, still all the teachers were like, the old school French chef, the one that used to complain about, you know, sexual harassment charges, those yeah. kind of guys. Mm-hmm. And but they talked about this chef Albert at Flying Saucer like he was legend, like he used to be an instructor here, and they let him go because he made everybody cry. And <laughs> and they said that anybody that can work for this guy will have it made for the rest of their life. So very next day, guess where I was? At the Flying Saucer. I want to work here. How'd that go? It was great. I made it. I mean, I, I worked there. That it was terrifying the first night. He did. He screamed, hollered, threw things. You know that old story of the uh, chef that stabs a knife in the critic's table? Yes. That was him. <laughs> He's that guy. Like, he did that. He's the one that created that legend, that urban legend, if you want to call it that, or urban myth. That was him. He actually did it. And he threw people out of the restaurant. He fired at least two people a night. And uh, But I made it, you know. I made it through the first night, and... He said, great job, man. I'll see you tomorrow. And I was like, oh, I did it. <laughs> so all you got to do is get through the night. Well, what did you learn from that experience? What was your big takeaway? I learned how to be quiet, keep my mouth shut, and say, yes, chef, for one, because you don't talk back and you, you just work. Everything was cut to order. Uh, the techniques that he taught were amazing. but how, And, you know, we couldn't cut anything ahead of time. Like if you put sliced cucumbers on a plate, you had to slice the cucumbers to order. I mean, everything had to be done to order. Uh, we did duck confits. We did, you know, just how to probably butcher, how to cook, cook, cook and cut vegetables. You know, we weren't allowed to use any peelers, so everything had to be carved like potatoes and carrots with a knife. And it was just the discipline of, you know, how you come in and work, how you organize the station, how you work clean. I mean, he caught a guy once putting a dirty towel over his shoulder, which I can't stand. I mean, he, he ruined that. So the chef went into the dirty linen and tied all these towels together, the dirty towels together in a robe, and he wore it around the kitchen. Like, doesn't I look great? My robe of filthy fucking towels. And he just humiliated this guy for 30 straight minutes. I mean, he'd stopped wow. everything he was doing to take a half an hour to humiliate this guy. I mean, it was, so obviously that made quite an impression on me. Yeah. And he was right. You know, you don't put dirty towels on you. I mean, it's gross. So do you ever find yourself thinking of him as you're managing your big crew of folks you got now in all those various restaurants? Well, I think he was a little extreme. I mean, <laughs> not not to say in my early days that I didn't have a little temper. Um, I don't think I ever personally attacked anyone's character, but uh, <laughs> I know I've hit a few walls and thrown a couple of things maybe a long time ago. continued going to culinary school and stuck around San Francisco. He worked in a handful of kitchens, prepping food at the Flying Saucer, spending days at a place called Scala's, and working the brunch shift at a restaurant called The Elite. And the chef there was uh, was an alcoholic and lazy, and I told him I didn't want to work there because it was a you know, Louisiana-style restaurant with yeah. really bad food. And a steam table. And I said, man, I, I can't. I can't work here. And uh, he's like, man, well, what if you just did brunch? And I was like, can I do anything I want? I said, that's the deal. I said, I'll make you a deal. I'll cook brunch if you let me throw away your menu and start from scratch and do anything I want. Then I'll work brunch. So he said yes because he didn't want to work Sunday so bad. <laughs> they let me do whatever I wanted. <laughs> So I, I meant six months into doing my own menu. Things are going great. People are loving it. I'm having a blast. It's me and one other cook. And we're doing like 300 brunches. I mean, this is back in the day where you just had to bust your ass. So one day my friend 
the other line cook. Grandfather died, so he had to leave. So the chef's like, well, I'll, I'll come in and work. So the way the line was set up is I did all the eggs. They did the poached eggs, toasting of the bread, and a couple other things. Um, but I did all the omelets to order, French, yellow, perfect omelets, you yes. know, nice, soft, scrambled eggs, over easy, the, you know, the, the whole bit. So he's like, well, I'm going to work the egg station. I said, man, you can't handle the egg station. <laughs> and it's eggs and tickets, and you got to do both. And I was like, man, you can't handle that. I said, you need to come over here and toast bread and poach eggs. He goes, well, I'm the chef, and I'm, I'm working the station. I was like, all right, man, don't fuck it up. So... <laughs> So here it comes. Service starts. Tickets start to pour in. I mean, this line's no joke, man. Service starts to pour in, and there he goes, browning the omelets. I mean, just I'm like, man, you can't put color on them. He goes, well, that's what I was taught. I said, well, you were taught wrong. So anyway, this he, it keeps getting worse. And then finally, I was like, man, I, I think I threw my spatula up against the wall, and I said, either get off my station or I'm walking. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he didn't, so I'm like, I just I said, I'll be out back smoking a cigarette if you change your mind. So in the middle of the rush, all hell's breaking loose. I just went back there and sat on the milk crate and just watched, waited. <laughs> Three minutes later, <laughs> man, you got to come back. I said, you're getting off my station? <laughs> he was fine. I was like, all right, I'll come back. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like I said, he really didn't want to work that station. Um Donald Link gets his way. Yeah, I was an asshole. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I love it. I mean, the guy was going down in a ball of flames. There was no yeah. way he could get out of it. Um, so, yeah, I worked there. Scala's uh, another place called Zazi for a little bit. Um, and then I got my intern at Bayona. Oh, you came to New Orleans so, as an intern to work with Susan Spicer. I started as, as an intern at Susan in 95. And I did that for a year and a half to two. Made it up to sous chef there. And then moved back to San Francisco to open Chardonnay with Tracy Desjardins. And was the opening sous chef slash purchaser buyer, which was a, an amazing experience and product. That was one of those kind of like, like flying saucer was the cooking techniques and and how to be a real solid, per, you know, perfect line cook. You know, what, what I learned at Jardinier was, you know, for two months before it opened and then a few months into it, I went to all the farms, all the butchers, all the cheese shops. I mean, I'm buying caviar out the back door. I thought it was illegal the way they used to sell it. They come through the back door and give you a little marble, uh, what is it, mother of pearl spoon, taste every 10. And it all seemed so shady. I was like, this is legal, right? I mean, I feel like I'm breaking the law here, but I know I'm not. So anyway, I learned a lot about product and ordering and, you know, for a big house. You know, it's like five, five 600 covers a day kind of place. And then I got... An offer, I heard that that chef at the Elite, the place where that guy, chef, worked, yes. heard he got fired. So I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to go see. I, I, this is my end. This could be my first chef job. I'm going to go in there. And I got my resume together, and I went in to the GM who was there when I cooked brunch. And, you know, I was really great with the GM and the owner. They loved me. Mm -hmm. And I went in, and I said, look, tell Tom. He was the owner at the time. I said, tell Tom that if he wants to do some real food here, and do something, upgrade everything that goes on here and let me have my way, I'd, I'd love to be the chef here. I said, I won't be the chef here with this menu, but if he wants to make a change and take it up, let me know. So I think it was like that night <laughs> he called and he said, man, I'd love to have you come in. I said, okay, well, just let's make sure we're really clear what we're talking about here. I'm going to throw all the food in the trash and start over. <laughs> so just so we're clear. Uh -huh. And and I want to write anything I want to do. I need 100% carte blanche. And he, and he agreed to it. He said, well, I'm going to tell you, you're going to have to fight on your hands because some of those people love those dishes. And I forgot which one it was. It was some like fried fish with crab meat sauce, cream shit all over it. And I was <laughs> like, I'll do something like that. And that's that's it. So I went in on a Sunday and the guy that I cooked brunch with was still there. So And we were still good friends. So I went in, I watched service, and it was horrible what those cooks were producing. I mean, just horrible. So at the end of the night, I said, all right, guys, throw everything in the trash. I said, if it's a cooked food item, I want it thrown away. And he looked at me like I was crazy. I said, no, everything, just dump it. So me and Kevin and I picked a couple guys out of that staff that I thought would work out and fired the rest and brought them in the next morning. It was a dinner only, thank God, and brunch. Mm -hmm. Went in the next morning and started a whole new menu for dinner that day. That day. That day. I mean, it just came up with a good, concise menu. 
And so I did that for God, a year and a half. Did they come cry about the oh, the yeah. fish with the crab meat cream sauce? And where was that? Yeah. Oh, it was the blackened one that they cried about the most because oh, I refused to disgusting. blacken anything. Yeah. I was like, no, we don't do that anymore. Well, that's bullshit. I was like, well, fucking go eat somewhere else. <laughs> I, mean, you know, I, was like, I was 27 years old at the time. I was like, I can give a shit. I remember standing up to this one cook. It was like this big. I'm like, if you don't like it, get the fuck out. <laughs> There's a fucking door right there. <laughs> I mean, God, I was just, yeah, rough. So things went really good at the Elite. <clears throat> things went good, man. 27-year-old got, Donald Blake. Got great write-ups. People loved the food. I mean, for every, any one person that didn't, that hated that I took their black and redfish off, that, you know, there's a hundred more that loved the food. And, you know, and then I started arguing with the GM over dumb stuff like, you know, because, you know, no one will ever be able to replace you. I'm like, well, how's that my problem? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I James even, Beard Award-winning chef at I, all I the even, restaurants. I even wanted to buy that restaurant. So anyway, they brought me to another place. The owner there was like, we have this opportunity in Palo Alto for you to do a restaurant. And this is where I learned a very valuable lesson on partnerships and money. This is, you know... If you look at the the phases of the career that where I learned the most, like, you know, obviously I learned cooking from, as a kid, you know, but the basis of it. But now we get to partnerships and business, you know. Um, at, at the Elite, my bonuses were tied into food costs. They were running a 37. I dropped it to 27 because I know how to add stuff. It's not that hard. You just right. have to pay attention. Uh, so anyway, we go to this place, and it's in Palo Alto, and the deal was we'll give you a third ownership, and all you have to do is repay out of profits. I think it was like a hundred or three hundred grand over time. You pay this back, and you'll own a third. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, great, sounds good. So I start writing a menu, and do you know I get a chance to start over, do my own thing, and I wasn't prepared for the onslaught that was coming when we opened, and I never got my contract. You know, but I was so busy trying to open the restaurant. My wife was pregnant with our first kid, Cassidy. And it was just this timing thing where we were basically changing the dates to open from when her birth was. Yeah. I mean, I have a picture of me and her at a week old in my chef coat and boxes all over the floor pointing like, <laughs> it's like, all right, here, take her. I'm going to go back to work. Uh, but I never did get that contract. And we opened the doors up, and I had a this girl I went to high school, uh, culinary school with managing, and she turned out not to be a really good manager. Uh, and again, a whole slew of new cooks that couldn't cook their way out of a paper bag. And then the, the first night, man, lines out the door. I mean, I, I guess I was, I didn't realize I was that popular until I opened that but restaurant. They followed you right up to Palo Alto. They followed me all the way up there, and it was busy every night, and the place was packed. Everything was going well. And then I finally get the contract, and I don't get any ownership. And I was like, well, I said, well, I thought, you know, I was getting a third. And they're like, well, I think you know, it was still a third, but now the price was like, you know, one and a half million or something. Basically, I just kind of got screwed on this deal because I didn't have the paperwork. I really didn't understand at that time, you know. You know, I'm looking at the simple version. It's 300 grand out of profit, and then you own a third, and you get that forever. Got it. Yeah. Put it in writing. And then I went and opened the restaurant without it, trusting that it would come and it would all say what it was supposed to say. So it didn't. So I said, well, I'm, I'm out. I mean, yeah. I'm, you know, I've got to, I'm going to stay here another three or four months to give you time to turn this thing that over to something to else. I said, but I have to leave. You know, it was kind to me, but I, I didn't, yeah, you know, the other I was Donald in no position to not be, uh, paid either okay yeah because now you're a daddy <laughs> but the pre-daddy donald would have gone outside and sat on the milk crate and smoked a cigarette yeah. until they reconsidered <laughs> well that was an issue of my food getting messed up and i didn't want to see it yeah. my yeah now you had your name so, tied to it all so anyway it didn't work out you know people were stealing i mean talk about coke everyone in there was ripping lines all over the place i mean it was just a it was hard to contain it was uh it was yeah, I mean, the food was really good. Uh, and then I just had to start getting someone else in there and telling them, look, you just do your stuff, I'm leaving. And that's when I started coming in New Orleans. We've been talking with Donald Link. 
executive chef at Herb Saint, and owner of the Link Restaurant Group. After all that salty language, I think we need a short, sweet break. Here's a slice of Granny Link's German chocolate cake. Many people think that all Cajuns are French, but Donald Link hails from German people who settled the Cajun Plains generations ago. The Zahnbrockers and the Lynx are still crawfish and rice farmers over in southwest Louisiana. Donald's granny Link moved to Sulphur from Crowley, where her parents originally settled after emigrating from Germany in the 1880s. In Donald's first book, Real Cajun, which won a James Beard Award in 2009, Donald shares the recipe for his granny's German chocolate cake. Our mutual friend, Ann Weatherford, was his first baker at Herb Saint, where she tweaked Granny's recipe using her own rich, moist blackout cake recipe. But oh my goodness, when it comes to the sweet, gooey coconut pecan filling, Donald's Granny really knew what she was doing. You'll find a copy of the recipe in today's show notes at poppytooker.com. And I wonder what Donald's granny would think about all that salty language that spills out of her grandson's mouth. Don't you? I'm Poppy Tooker, and you're listening to a Louisiana Eats Quick Bite. We've been talking with Donald Link, award-winning chef, author, and savvy businessman. Donald grew up in southwestern Louisiana's Calcasieu Parish, then moved to California and excelled in the kitchens of San Francisco. He'd been working for other people, but eventually decided to work for himself. Well, first I started looking around California, and, you know, there were a lot of jobs paying six figures that were clipboard chef jobs, you know. Yeah. You know, show the uh, Latinos how to make crab cakes and Caesar salad kind of job. Yeah. Didn't want that. You know, that was not me. I didn't want that in my life. So then I met with my father-in-law, and he was like, what will it take to get you guys and my granddaughter back to New Orleans? I said, well, I could do some help getting my own restaurant open. So, and I came here looking at restaurant spaces, ran into Susan uh-huh. at a bar. We met up at the Matador, I believe is what, what <laughs> it's not there anymore, but the Matador. <laughs> Uh, and started talking and said, well, Kenny and I were thinking about doing the restaurant. And I'm like, well, I'm here looking at restaurants too. And that's when we decided to do it together with, you know, her name here, me coming in from out of town again. And, you know, there was a story there from me working for her. Uh, and, you know, it opened up as a really good partnership. And, I mean, God, what we opened that for now compared then, what it would cost now is <laughs> a staggering incredible. difference. But it was it was a great opening, you know. I mean, I love Susan. I mean, Susan was a great mentor of mine at Bayona. She's the one that probably got me calmed down the most because I was kind of a hothead. I think my nickname was Hotshot or something when I worked over there. Mm-hmm. John yeah. Harris. <laughs> you know, John Harris and I cooked at Bayona together. That must have been interesting times. The first week was rough, and Susan had to pull me aside. I'm like, look, everyone... Uh, Thinks you're kind of an asshole. And you need to settle down a little bit. <laughs> but it's such a tiny and little like, kitchen. There's no I, room for an but asshole. But I can cook circles around all of them, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. That's what John would said later. He goes, "Yeah, you were a dick, but you know what? You could back it up." <laughs> <laughs> In the year 2000, Donald opened Herb Saint in partnership with Chef Susan Spicer. Herb Saint quickly became a favorite of critics and customers alike. The Times Picayune called the food routinely pitch perfect treatment of European classics. By 2007, Donald was named James Beard's best chef in the South and was on his way to building an empire. He partnered with Chef Steven Strajewski to create Koshan, which immediately garnered more beard recognition. And in 2014, their restaurant, Pesh, was named Best New Restaurant in America, and their chef partner, Ryan Pruitt, received Best Chef of the South. The staff we have now are just night and day from what we started with. And it was rough in the beginning. You know, I did everything. I mean, I worked... Eight in the morning to two in the morning. I mean, every day. I mean, I did the prep, the expo. I cooked the line. I mean, I washed dishes. 
I think the the key element. I'm, I'll never forget the uh, having the conversation with my wife when I said I wanted to open a second restaurant, and she's like, "Why?" <laughs> I said, "I think I'll have more time." And she goes, "That's insane. <laughs> that thinking doesn't work." I'm like, "Well, this is the way I look at it. I want to open Koshan, and Koshan was." For one, I think Steve is awesome, obviously, and I knew it he right is. away when he was he, he was a grill cook at Herb Saint, and I'm like, man, that guy's got talent, so I make him a sous chef, and obviously he's a great sous chef. I'm like, start thinking, you know, I've been slaving away in his kitchen for years and years. I, can I do this when I'm sixty or fifty? I mean, it's, I'm not going to want to do this thirty years from now. I mean, there's got to be a, a plan, and I don't want to lose Steve. Steve's going to leave. Or anybody that, you know, nothing like Steve in particular is the kind that's going to leave, but somebody with that much talent is going to need to move up. Right. And there's an opportunity there for Koshan was to, you know, bring the food of my childhood into a restaurant and bring in Steven as a partner. And, you know, to give him, because, you know, I can't be the chef at every restaurant. I can't be in every kitchen all day long. Just, in my opinion, what it takes to be, you know, a chef of one restaurant, you got to be there all the time and you've got to be in charge and there's got to be a singular point of accountability. And Steve was talented, man. He's a great cook. He can run a kitchen, you know, because being a good chef is not just being a good cook. I mean, you got to be able to lead people. And it's a personality style and a culture as a restaurant that was very important to me. You know, when I moved to New Orleans, you know, one of my biggest goals in a restaurant was I want to own a place that if I worked there, I'd want to go every day and enjoy the people I stand next to every day. You know, I worked in a lot of kitchens where it wasn't like that. People, like, stabbed each other in the back and bitched about each other, and it was just somebody's over there bitching about somebody, and it's like, I don't, you know, I never wanted any of that, and we don't have that. I'd be more apt to fire someone on the spot for complaining about something than I would if they were in the back smoking crack. <laughs> I mean, oh, I'd, rather, I'd rather I'd rather catch someone ripping a line than uh-huh. bitching about another employee. I mean, to me, the, the that's poison and that's the worst thing yeah. you could do. I was fortunate enough to be able to, to get people on the same page, and that's just kind of kept growing to where, you know, you get new managers and new cooks and new chefs, and they and they love what we do and how we run a business. You know, it's the way we handle our food, you know, the way we work with local farms. And, you know, we're, we're buying... I mean, so much. I mean, the, the amount of money that local. we put into the local farming community is, is massive. And people like that, you know, getting whole animals, you know, letting cooks rotate through making terrines and butchering. And, you know, because being a line cook can get old after a while. You know, you've got this, you're cooking the same food every night, you know, with the addition of a few specials. But to be able to move around and see other things and to work at a place where you can be proud of the food you're putting out and the person next to you is pushing you. Instead of you carrying them is very important. I yeah. think that if it's not fair to bring someone in that can't keep up with the rest of the, the line, and that's where you kind of lose that culture. But, the, you know, the people that that are management across the board and everybody down to the wait staff, the dishwashers, I mean, the whole staff, I think, is just really a good unit. I mean, we have our company barbecues and Christmas parties, Mardi Gras parties, and it. You know, everybody comes out and it's everybody gets along with each other, restaurant to restaurant, dishwasher to manager. I mean, there's just a good vibe in the in the group. And I think that that is what carries out to the floor, which then turns into, I guess, James Beard Awards. I mean, it's kind of like a courtship in a way mm-hmm. where, you, you know, partnerships are, are very important. I mean, they're, they're like marriages and... You have to know that you're going to be spending time with these people, and you know, good or bad. Mm-hmm. And partnerships are really tested more when things are when you don't agree. I was going to ask you about that. How and, do you settle things when you don't agree? Uh, we always agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure, Donald. <laughs> but you know, like I said, that's that's part of the courtship. You know, you, you just find your way through it, and it, it's basically a matter of like when you go. Uh, hey, I got an idea. Let's talk about it, and and that's how we approach things. It's like, well, what do you think about this? Uh, well, I don't know. Maybe if we did this instead. And there's just always a process. And I can't say that there's never been an, an impasse on some things. But, you know, you get to a point where, and they're very few and far between. But when we get to an impasse, like if we say Steve and I, for example, don't agree on something, mm-hmm. then, it, then it has to come down to another level of how important is it to you? All right. Who does it mean more to at this point, And can you live with it? 
and, and then we move on. But Donald's real prized pig, Koshan Butcher. We used to have all our meetings on the sidewalk in front of Herb Saint, which I miss so much having my meetings there. Uh, and I have, I still have the original. I take these eight and a half by eleven sheets of paper and fold them in half and make a little book, and that's how I take notes. And I have the original performa numbers for Butcher, and it's an eighth of what we're doing now. Wow. And it's it just blew up, man. That place, I mean, we never in a million years thought it could do those kind of numbers. I mean, it's a it's a beast. Because people, man, God, I just you see the lines outside that place. Yeah. I mean, but it's really it's it's food that everybody's familiar with and it's done really well with the meats that we make and the, everything's made in house. And it's got a great fun vibe. It's approachable. Totally. Um the music's loud. I mean, it's kind of funky and it's not so you know the the key to restaurants is really combining your 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 concept and and making it make sense with each other. I mean the the space, the food, the style all has to be together. If one of those things gets off, it's just that's the kind of that hidden thing that makes restaurants work or not work. Mm-hmm. It's really unfortunately not always about the food. You know, it's about how they jive together. Does does someone walking in with a certain perception of what a restaurant is is that met? Uh-huh. Is that expectation level met when they walk in or exceeded? Or is it, well, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. And that's what makes or breaks restaurants. Donald, I want to thank you so much for spending this time with me and always yep, being so fun. welcoming. And you're just always so wonderful to me whenever I can catch you. <laughs> thank you, Donald. All right, Bobby. Thanks. That's Donald Link Uncensored, chef, restaurateur, and outspoken homegrown Louisiana boy. Music for this episode comes from Frames in Motion. Louisiana Eats original theme music by Johnny Sketch and the Dirty Notes. Thanks to Joe Schreiner, Reggie Morris, and Thomas Walsh for production help. Don't miss a single serving of Louisiana Eats or our Quick Bite series by subscribing to our podcast. You'll find a link to subscribe in today's show notes. Also, visit poppytooker.com for lots more recipes and delicious food ideas. I'm Poppy Tooker. Thanks for listening. And thanks to our major sponsors, Camellia Bean, Zatarans, French Market Coffee, and Rouse's Markets. Visit poppytooker.com to see a full list of our partners. This was a quick bite of Louisiana Eats, produced by Poppy Tooker Broadcasting. <laughs>